Well, I'm very happy this afternoon to introduce um, Kirk. And it, Kirk, it looks like you've been a busy man here. I'm reading over the um, bio on Kirk, and he's uh, founded a ministry called Family Time Training in 1999. Does more than 80 trainings each year to 8,000 plus members. He's written eight books and has done his collegiate work at Wheaton College and the University of Missouri, currently living in Colorado. So we thank you very much for coming to us this afternoon, with us this afternoon and presenting to us. And before we get started, I'll just have a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to learn more and to glean uh, new ideas that we can share in our churches and with our kids and our Sabbath schools. We ask these blessings in your name and be with um, Mr. Weaver today. I pray in your name. Amen. Thank you, Keith. I absolutely love presenting this workshop. For those who know me and those who don't, my whole passion is about getting spiritual training back in the home. And so we work with families at trying to equip them to do spiritual training in the home. And you'll see in some families that'll try it once, they'll try it three times, they'll try it six times, and it drifts away. For the families who stick with it, for the churches who stick with it to support the families in continuing to do spiritual training at home, it's this workshop that makes the difference. This workshop answers the why question. I did a workshop this morning on how to do it, and you're going to see a couple activities which will help you understand how to do it. But this really talks about why is spiritual training in the home so important. I want to just go over our vision picture. This is, uh, we did a vision picture. That's not our vision picture. <laughs> we did uh, <clears throat> a vision picture this year of trying to come up with the vision of family time in a way that we could see it. To see family time, bring God's word into the family so all generations will live for Jesus. Here we go. There it is. And with this is taken from Psalms 1 where you have the, the waters being God's word, you have the tree being the family, and you have the fruit being the hearts of future generation. That's our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. If you could read it, there's a little root and it says family time on it. Family time is a conduit. To, it's a tool that gets spiritual training into the family. I would hope that children's ministry would see itself as another root. It's another conduit that gets God's word into the family. But here's what's happened in churches today. And I don't know your specific church, but I know churches in general. Here's what's happened. Is it isn't getting God's word into the family. It's skipping the trunk and trying to get God's word into the kids without ever dealing with the family. And so family time is about getting it in the home. We're going to look at the why is spiritual training in the home so important. How is it that it's God's vision? I want to show you a picture of a guy on a desert island. Now, let's say I gave you a Bible, put you on a desert island, <clears throat> and I said, your job is to answer one question. And that question is, what is God's plan for how we pass the faith from one generation to the next? So you start in Genesis, and you read through Genesis, you read through the Old Testament, you get to New Testament, you read through New Testament, you get to Revelation, you read through Revelation. As you read through the Bible, and as you seek to answer that question, how do we pass the faith from one generation to the next? <clears throat> you will not find a plan for children's ministry. You will not find a plan for youth ministry. What you will find is from beginning to end, God's plan for the family to be the primary source of spiritual training. So why would I say that at a children's minister's conference? Why would I say that? Because that doesn't make children's ministry wrong. That doesn't make youth ministry wrong. I want my church to have strong children's ministry and strong youth ministry that supports what I'm doing as a parent in the home. But where it becomes a problem is when Sabbath school and, and Christian schools and the other programs that we have 
become more primary than what's happening in the home. Because when we do that, we're now out of alignment with God's plan. And we are going to struggle, as the statistics will tell you, to pass the faith. Three major purposes for the family. God created families to be discipleship centers. It is through the family where our children will learn or not learn about him. I have friends who are non-believers, and they will say, I'm not going to expose my kids to that faith talk or to religion. But do you understand, they are teaching a religion. They're teaching a strong religion that says, I'm not even going to explore the truth. Okay, so we're, we're one way or another, we're passing a faith. Two, the biblical purpose of parenting is to impress children's hearts for God. Our children will learn about God, a lot or a little, good or bad, personal or impersonal, from us. When I did my graduate work at the University of Missouri in Columbia, I did it on God concepts. Where do we get our God concepts? And there was all this study out there of you get it from the father, you get it from the mother, you get it from a dominant adult in your life. And we did all those studies. The reality is we are the first, for our youngest of kids, we are the first example of what God is in their lives, and it makes a difference. And this is what I want to focus on today, the third purpose. The family is God's primary engine of world evangelization. The power of multi-generational faithfulness. We're going to talk about this, but I want you to know that you have been invited to be a part of something so much bigger than you could ever imagine. You've been invited to be a part of something where we are called to fill this earth with people who will honor and worship God, and it's going to happen through the family. So here's why I'm talking to children's ministers. You get it. If anyone in your church is going to take back this message of equipping families, retraining them, supporting them in being spiritual trainers in the home, it's going to be you. And if they're going to listen to anybody, it's going to be you. You do what you do because you see what, how the kids respond in the time you have with them. But you also see that that's not enough. So what would you do? What would it take for you to spend 10% of your time equipping parents knowing that you would have four to five times the impact, spiritual impact in those kids' lives? So, okay, you can't count them in a church program, but you can count equipping the parent, and now the child has spiritual training throughout the week, not just at Sabbath school. So I'm going to show you a family time activity, and I want to share the difference between what happens when this happens at home and when it happens in the church, in a, in a Sabbath school class. Okay, so I start with a pie pan, and in this pie pan I have some pieces of paper. And what we're going to do as a family, so if you can picture me and my wife and my two kids sitting at a table, we're each going to write on one of these pieces of paper a sin that we struggle with. Now, we happen to have done an activity the week before where we put a target on the wall and we threw balls at the target. And if you hit the target, we went, yay. And if you missed the target, we said, sin. Because the theological definition of sin is missing the target. So mom, dad, everybody's thrown until everybody misses the target. Why? Because Paul tells us in Roman, all have sinned and fall short of the mark. Okay? So we're playing this game, and the purpose of the game is teach them that the definition of sin is missing the target. So what is that target? That target is God's will for our lives. He has told us in his word the kind of words we should use, thoughts we should have, actions we should do. When we do what God tells us to do, it's hitting that target. Yay! When we do what we want to do ahead of what God tells us to do, that's missing the target, and that's sin. So I might say to my daughter, you know, last week when you hauled off and smacked your brother, chances are you missed the target on that one. So we're going to go around the family, and we're going to share specific sins we struggle with. When my son was young, he struggled with using the word stupid. He knew he wasn't supposed to use the word stupid. We told him don't use that word. But when he got mad, what word do you think he liked to use? Stupid. So there were things in the house that were stupid we didn't know could be stupid. Chairs were stupid. <laughs> stairs were stupid. There are all kinds of stupid things. And sometimes the people were stupid. Okay, so here's how that usually goes as a parent. Your child gets upset. He starts using the bad word. And you go, if you use that word one more time, 
Now, my son will look right at me, and he'll go, stupid, stupid, stupid. Okay? So now not only do you have a bad word, but you have an attitude problem. So it's just compounding. It's getting worse. But here we are doing family time. We start with him. I say, you know, you struggle with using the word stupid. He turns to me, and he says, Dad, I know. I'll try not to. What? Why would I get that kind of response? Because he's not upset. He can hear me. And he knows we're all going to share something. Now my daughter, she's slightly older. I'm not sure why we bought this girl dressers. Because we'll go buy her, we'll go buy her room. There can't possibly be a piece of clothing in any of the drawers. <laughs> it's on the floor, it's on the bed, it's hanging off bookshelves. So she's working on obedience. We say, keep your room clean. She said, Dad, I'll go clean it up. You look in there 20 minutes later, nothing's changed. Baby, Dad, I'm on my way. So she's working on obedience. Now, as a parent, you want to share the things that you struggle with and you're working on. Now, for me, a big one, and just ask any member of my family, is apparently I have this tone of voice. When I get upset or I get judgmental, I get this tone of voice, something that goes on. And they all know when it happens. I don't always know, but they know. So I'm working on this tone of voice. I'm working on that, all right? So we end up with a pie pan filled with our sins. In this object lesson, the jar of water represents us. We have the pie pan, and then we have the egg, which represents God. And we have a wobbly stage and a wobbly table, so this is going to be fun. All right, so if God is the egg and we're the jar of water, what separates us from God? Our sin. So what we need is we need a sin buster. We need somebody who can come into our life, take away the sin, so that we can be back together with God. Now, who do you think could be our sin buster? Jesus. That's right. So I take this broom. I write Jesus on a piece of masking tape, and I put it around the handle of the broom. I now have an egg balanced in the air. I have a broom in my hand. I have my children's undivided attention. Perhaps for the first time this afternoon, I have your undivided attention. What is he going to do with that broom? Okay? So now I take a couple minutes to talk about things we can do to help us make good choices. Things like participating in children's ministry. It's in children's ministry where our kids will find their Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They'll find kids who have been trained and believe the same values and can help support each other as they go through life. And here's a big one. I don't care if your kids are preschool, elementary, junior high, high school. The friends you choose. The friends you choose will have a major impact on the number of times you hit that target and keep from sinning. So Jesus comes into our life. He takes away the sin so that we can be back together with God. There's the gospel in the language of children. Have we got the slide, knock sin out? Let's look at that slide. Knock sin out. Every one of our activities comes with the scriptures that you need to teach that activity. Now, as children's ministers, you see something like this, you go, oh, ho, 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 next Sunday, I can't wait. I'm going to do this. And we know that people use our activities to work with their children's curriculum. But if that's all we do, we actually become part of the problem and not part of the solution. The more we add bells and whistles to our one hour on, on Sabbath morning, and the less we do to equip parents, we create this chasm between what they think is possible. Now think about, I go to pick up my third grader after Sunday school, and they've had this lesson in their class. And I say, hey, what'd you learn today at Sunday school? By the way, the number one answer is nothing. It's not because they learn nothing. It's because mentally they're on to their next thing. They're playing with their friends. They're getting ready for lunch. They probably had a great time, but they don't want to talk about that. They're looking forward. Okay, so nothing. Okay, so the parent leaves without any information. Let's say they got really excited about this, and the parent says, what'd you do in Sunday school class? Dad, you wouldn't have believed it. This pie pan, it just went flying. The egg went down in water and this and that. Ah, oh, thanks for sharing, you know. And you don't have a clue what they were talking about, right? Now, this happens in the home. 
the very first thing the kids say when you do this, do it again. Do it again. Because they haven't paid a lick of attention until all of a sudden they see the egg in the jar. And they go, how'd that happen? Dad, do it again. I say, you know what? Our family times are all voluntary. I say, we'll do it as many times as you want. You just have to tell me what the different things represent. What are the pieces of paper? Uh, I don't remember. That's their sin. Sin. Okay. Who's the broom? Jesus. That's right. Jesus is the broom. Who's the egg? That's God. Okay. And so now, do you see they've moved to a higher level of teaching? They're now teaching themselves the faith. Here's what happens after that. Dad? Yeah? Billy's coming over. Billy's going to want to see the broom and the egg. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll get out the broom and the egg. You just have to tell Billy what everything represents. Now they're sharing the faith with their friends. Why? Because it's in the language of children. They're excited about it, and it's part of their home life. Sometimes uh, I have two kids. More often than not, I had more than four kids at my house. My children would invite their friends to family time. In every case, we called the parents and said, my son would like it if your son would come. Uh, here's what we do. We teach a Bible story and do a fun game that goes with it. No parent said no. We had Hindu kids, Buddhist kids, New Age kids. We had everybody come into our house. Every child in a two-block radius of our cookie-cutter neighborhood came to at least one of our family times. Sometimes we build churches and we say, how do we get the people in those, church, in those houses into our church? When sometimes we need to be saying, how do we get the people in this church out into those houses? And when we start living the faith in our homes on our block, we become the church on our block and we become a relevant option for why they would come to the church building. So that's the difference between doing one, doing spiritual training at home and doing it at church. Now let's go through the scriptures as to what God says. Genesis 1, 28, the very first commandment in the scriptures. God blessed them, Adam and Eve, and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. When's the last time you heard the first commandment preached, which is to be fruitful and fill the earth? Then in Genesis 9, 1, then God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. So again, they're getting ready to start over. What's the point of the family? To fill the earth. Genesis 12, 2. I love this. God is talking to Abraham. He says, I will make you into a great nation and bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all people on earth will be blessed through you. So God's plan is to bless everyone on earth through this one person, through Abraham. So what does Abraham have to do to achieve this mind-boggling blessing? Genesis 18, 18, 19. Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. Now get this, for I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. How are all the nations in the world going to be blessed through this one man? By raising a godly family. Do you want a godly home? Raise godly children. Do you want a godly neighborhood? Raise godly children. Do you want a godly j nation? Raise godly godly children. And then here's what happens. He, he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. God's going to do all the work. He's the one that's going to bless the nations through this man who then raises godly kids. Exodus 20:12. Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Now, I love this. This is uh, out of the Ten Commandments. It's the Fifth Commandment. First four have been about a vertical relationship between us and God. This is the first of the horizontal commandments about how to be loving and in relationship with those around us. And it says to honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land. Now, some get hung up on, does that mean if I 
honor my mom and dad, I get to live to be 100. I love what Vody Bauckham says about this. And what Vody Bauckham says is the faith will have a long life in your family. If you raise your children who then honor you, the mother and father who are teaching them about Jesus and about God, then the faith is going to have a long life in the heritage of your family. Deuteronomy 4.9. Teach them, and that's the commandments, to your children and to their children after them. This is for grandparents. Teach the faith to your children and to their children after them. The fastest growing group that we work with is grandparents. And I got to tell you, I was doing family time for probably seven years, and I ran into the Ashtons down in Arizona. The Ashtons were in their 70s, and they had chosen to be proactive spiritual trainers with their great nephew, Tim, when Tim was just eight years old. And here's what the Ashtons did. They sent them a letter every month with a $20 bill. They said, use 10% of this to give to the church or some ministry. Use another 10% to do something nice for a family member or friend. Take a third 10% and save for some big purchase or for your education later. And then you can do whatever you want with the rest. If you write us back and you tell us how you've used the money, we'll send you another $20 the next month. If you don't write us back, no more money. That's the end of the gravy train. When I was down visiting the Ashtons, they showed me two notebooks this thick of letters they had sent to Tim and letters and pictures they had received from Tim with a whole list of things he had supported, helping the homeless on the streets, giving to a chapel at his school, all these different things. These people, the Ashtons, were being proactive spiritual teachers with their nephew, Tim, and here's the mind-boggling part of this story. The Ashtons in their 70s, living in Arizona, had never even met their great nephew, Tim, who lived in Oregon. They'd never even met him. And along with those checks, they were including stories about how the Christian faith had been an important part of their family's life growing up. Just last year was the first national conference on on grandparenting, spiritual grandparenting called a Legacy Coalition outside of Dallas. It took us this long to realize this verse, Deuteronomy 4.9, the importance, the impact that grandparents had. So the story of the Ashtons, I'm doing all these family times with my kids. I realize my mom would love to be a part of this. It never occurred to me to invite my mom to be a part of the spiritual train of their grandchildren. So I told mom the story. I said, do you want to do this? With tears in her eyes. I would love to be a part of that. When my mom died, she had two notebooks this thick with letters back and forth to her grandchildren. Many of us have good, strong relationships with our parents, and we can invite them to be a part. I lost a dear friend last week, Neil Parrott. Neil Parrott was the first guy I knew who was known as a family time grandparent. Grand, kids have two or three sets of grandparents. And Neil and his wife, Kathy, were the family time grandparents in that home. They'd go, we're going to this house. They'd go, oh, we're going to the family time grandparents' house. Because every time they went, they did one of these lessons. Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 7. Anybody in children's ministry knows this first. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you rise up. How do we do it? We talk to them. And when we use activities and object lessons, it helps the message stick. When do you do it? As you sit, as you walk, as you lie down, as you rise up. Is it the Sunday school teacher that's in a child's life during those times? No. It's the family. It's the parent and the grandparent. All right, I want to show you another activity. I love this. And, and what you had in Deuteronomy 6, 7 was you had, you had a family-led spiritual training. So I want to show you the difference between family-led spiritual training, in other words, family first, church support, versus church support, 
family secondary, if at all, okay? So I got three classes. I'm one of those guys who does this. Everybody in the world is represented by one of these three glasses. I know it's usually two glasses, but I got three glasses here. So this represents everybody in the world. You are one of these glasses. These are three different types of people. So we have the milk, and the milk represents what we do with our lives. This represents everything we say, think, and do. So the three glasses are three different types of people, and the milk represents what we say, what we think, what we do, everything that we do with our lives, okay? Now, this first person over here has a hard heart. So I have a piece of cardboard, and I put it over the top. The top of these glasses represents the heart to the person, and this one type of person has a hard heart to Jesus. This is a great time to start talking about people with hardened hearts in the Bible. You got Pharaoh, right? All these plagues coming his way. He never did give in, and it cost him his son. It cost him really a bunch of people drowning in the Red Sea, too. But here's what I also want to tell my children. The Apostle Paul, when his name was Saul, he had a hard heart. He was hardened for, toward Christ, and God opened his heart. So you're not destined to have a hard heart. You can be open to what God has to offer. Now, in this object lesson, Jesus is represented by the chocolate syrup. I think that's quite an honor. If I were going to be part of an object lesson, I'd want to be represented by the chocolate syrup. All right? So Jesus is the chocolate syrup. He goes to this first person who has a hard heart and has closed his heart to hearing more about Jesus and having Jesus in his life. But he goes to these next two people, and their hearts are open, and they invite Jesus to come in. So you might say at this point to your kids, how much Jesus do you want in your life? Well, they're going to want a lot of Jesus in their life. Well, when we get Jesus, we also get the Holy Spirit. So I got two spoons here with the Holy Spirit written on it. Three different type of people in the world. Those that have closed their hearts to Jesus. Those that have opened their hearts to Jesus. But here's what's different about this person. I want you to imagine that my stirring this spoon represents someone who's listening to the Holy Spirit. The stirring represents listening. Okay, we have this voice that God has given us, the Spirit directing us what to do. Here's the choice you have to make. This is a good choice. This is a bad choice. Okay, I'm going to make the good choice. Whoa. Okay, so imagine that this spoon continues to turn, all right? It's still turning. This one is not turning. This is the difference between Sunday only and family-led. You've heard it called nominal Christianity. You've heard it called Sabbath day only Christians. If all we do is do church at Sabbath, and we have the Spirit in our lives and talking to us, but we ignore the direction of the Spirit and the things we should do, the things we should think, the things we should say, our life is going to look much more like this life than it's going to look like this life. Because if we're listening to the leading of the Spirit, our finances are going to look different. How we spend our time is going to look different. Where we spend our time is going to look different. And your life is going to look different, which is why we are losing so many kids to the faith. When we compartmentalize the faith to one hour in church programs or two hours in church programs, and that's where the spiritual training takes place, we look like this, and our kids are more likely to come up like this than they are to come up like this. That's the power of getting spiritual training back in the home. Have we had the chocolate milk slide up yet? Again, these are, uh, oh, that's nice. It's a nice picture. These come with the scriptures that go with it. And let's continue. There it is. <clears throat> so every one of our activities gives you the scriptures. We also will bold words that the families need to say. See, most families don't know how to do this, and they'll sit there with the activity in front of them, and they'll see the bold words, and they'll read them. And that's how they first get started before they get the confidence 
to put it in their own words. <clears throat> Again, another one of my favorite scriptures, Psalm 78, 5 through 7. He decreed statues for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded. Now listen to this. You're going to see four generations here. He commanded our forefathers to teach their children so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. This is so key to how God intends to pass the faith. Our forefathers to teach their children so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. So we got four generations. And oftentimes when it comes to spiritual training of kids, we use the analogy of a relay race and passing the baton. I mean, I have books that are passing the baton. I want to amend that analogy just a little bit, okay? Because I want you to think about a relay race. The first runner is done running their leg, and they're going to pass the baton. And usually the story at this point in the books of passing this faith is, don't drop the baton and make a clean handoff. I mean, that's what you learn if you're a relay runner. And so they pass the baton. The second runner takes off and is running at full speed. What happened to the first runner? They stopped. In Psalm 78.5, the first runner passes the baton to their children and runs alongside them until they get to the grandchildren. And they pass the baton to the grandchildren, and all three generations run together. They pass it to the fourth generation, and they all cross the finish line together. That's God's plan for how we pass the faith. And I got to tell you, we've got generations that have been raised out there that say, they're out of the home. They're out of high school. Good luck. I planted the seeds. Good luck. No. We are their parents, and we are called to be spiritual trainers. One of the main ways I do that with my kids that are now older, I have a 25 and a 22-year-old, is through letters. My son is in Mongolia. All I can do is letters, you know, and text messages. My daughter is closer to home, but I, when I when – I, write something, uh, whether it be for this guy's funeral last week, I make copies and I share it with him. I share my values. When I, I got uh, pulled over for not wearing a seatbelt and it cost me 75 bucks and I wrote it up, you know, in a letter to my kids, hey, don't be stupid like I was and here's why and all that and be safe and all that. I write those things up. I share those things as I continue to go through life. All right, now we get to the end of the scriptures. We're Malachi 4, 6, end of the Old Testament. We're uh, four to 500 B.C., somewhere in there. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. What's so fascinating is the last words of the Old Testament are the first words spoken in the New Testament. Luke chapter 1, verse 17. And he, John, will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. That's the bridge between the old and the new is the fathers passing the faith to their children. Matthew 29, verses 19 to 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. This is known as the Great Commission. We are to go out and pass the faith. That is why we are here. We are here to fill this earth with people who will love and worship Jesus. How are we going to accomplish that great commission? Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 38. The promise, I want to make sure this is up there. Thank you. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. The promise, don't miss this, is for you, your children, and all who are far off. 
Here's what's happened in the church today, and I'm talking about the church in general. We do real good at the promises for you. You'll hear all kinds of sermons on be reading the Bible, be in prayer, develop your spiritual disciplines, develop that relationship you have with God. We do really well at that. We also do really well with those who are far off. We have great mission programs. We are, you know, we are sending money to help those in need here, help those in need far off. We are good at missions. We are good at personal discipleship. Where we miss is we miss with the children. It's for you, your children, and those who are far off. We are to be teaching our children. And I want to show you. I'm not sure if this comes up next. Nope, we got one more. Nope, we're there. All right, so let's look at the next slide. And then the next one. I call this vertical missions, all right? This is horizontal missions. Horizontal missions is we are to reach the city, the nation, the world. That's horizontal missions. Let's look at the next one. And let's hold this up there. What we miss is we miss vertical missions. We miss parents teaching their children, teaching their grandchildren, and teaching their great-grandchildren. Who in the next generation is going to be doing horizontal missions? It's going to be our kids. Who in the generation after that is going to be doing the horizontal missions? It'll be our grandkids. If we fail to pass the faith in vertical missions, we have no horizontal missions. Family time, families as the primary source of spiritual training in the lives of their home, is vertical missions. Now I got to show you, before you put this up, before you put this next one up, I got to do the disclaimer. I'm going to show you something that isn't realistic. It doesn't happen, but I'm trying to make a point, all right? When we talk about horizontal missions, Let's say I had the gift of evangelism and I went out every week and I shared the gospel with somebody and by the Lord's grace that person became a believer. Every week I did that. At the end of the year I'd have 52 that had been reached for, through me for Jesus, that God used me to reach them. What would I have at the end of 50 years? I did this every week. For 50 years, I'd have 2,600 people reached. 2,600 at the end of 50 years. My friend Rob Reno gave me the following graph, which we'll put up in a second, not yet. He has six kids, and he decided to do the math. What if his six kids had six kids, who had six kids, who had six kids, and they proactively taught the faith to all their children and they were all believers. Now, that's where it falls apart. Not everybody's going to have six kids. Not everybody's going to have kids. Not everybody's going to have kids who follow in the faith. You don't have control over that. But what would it look like? Let's look at this. In the seventh generation from one family of six, you would have 279,936 believers. If you total all seven of those generations, you have 335,922 believers. Do you see how family is God's plan for how we fill the earth with people who will love and worship him? It's in the family that we have intimate relationships. It's where we have close relationships. It's where we have belief systems that will stick. Don't overlook in our churches vertical missions. And vertical missions is not necessarily children's ministry programs. What it is, is it's children's ministers who understand their role in retraining and equipping families to be the primary source of spiritual training. Now, I'm going to share some statistics and I, I loved what, uh, I'm going to call him Pastor Joe. He said I could call him that. Pastor Joe shared the first 
night about statistics. He kind of questions, and he said he put out a statistic, and it kind of just kept gaining momentum, and he questioned it. So I'm going to use some statistics, and I want to challenge you that if you disagree with them, test them yourself, okay? Because what is happening is the reports are coming back that somewhere between 73 and 92% of youth in church today say that when they are out of their family's home, they no longer intend to go to church. Do you get that? 75 to 92% of youth in church today say that when they're out of their parents' home, they no longer intend to go to church. To put flesh on that, it's taking two families with two kids each to get one believer into the next generation. I want you to think of that vertical mission and that, okay? Now, those of us who are a little bit older, we remember an experience of maybe we left church for a little bit after high school, but then we had kids and we came back. But that's not happening anymore. The Billy Graham School of Missions, and let's look at this research. Billy Graham School of Missions did a research on who were professing Christians. Now, there's a talk out there if you go and say, hey, are you a Christian? 70% of people in America will say they're Christian. This went a little deeper and said, do you believe that Jesus is the way? And does that influence your belief? So they went a little deeper as to Jesus was the way and was the source of their Christian faith. My parents' generation, <coughs> the builders, 65% professing Christian. You get that whole generation in a room in a city, 65% of those people profess Christ. My generation, the boomers, 35% professing Christian. Next generation, the busters, 15% professing Christian. The current generation of 25-year-olds, 4% professing Christian. It's happening. We are losing generation after generation. One of the reasons is we're out of alignment with God's plan. We are working so hard, a broken system. We are working so hard, we're pouring so many resources. Could we tweak it now? Some of you who the Spirit has been working on to hear this message are thinking, how do I go back and change my whole system? How do I get back in alignment with God's plan? Here's what I'm encouraging you, four families. If a year from today you have four families who hadn't been doing spiritual training in the home, now intentionally doing spiritual training in the home, you've made a huge step. You now have the leaders for future family ministry in your church. You cannot change the whole church system. You, you don't need to change the whole church system. I want a strong children's ministry. I just need to, at the same time, be the person sounding the, I don't want to call it alarm, sounding the bell saying, let's be doing this as home as God has planned for it to be done. Okay, so I told you about statistics and, and challenging them. Matt Ellis is one of my heroes. He was a youth leader at a church not far from my home, big church, big youth program, about 200 kids. And I'm sitting here talking, and I'm sharing these statistics. He looks right at me. I was mentoring him. He was in seminary. He says, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. I've got this great youth program. We have all these kids. We have live music. We put the scriptures up on the wall. We have lots of volunteers. Volunteers love the kids. Kids love us. We're having a great time. I don't believe it. So on his own, he contacted the last 200 youth that had gone through his youth program. Out of that 200 youth, 12 were still in church. 94% had left church. Now, here's what was fascinating about his study. Out of the 12, six of the 12 had been involved in a class at church called Salt and Pepper. It was a Sabbath school class open to adults and teens. Why would that happen? Because they built relationship with the people they would then go on to worship with. Matt resigned as a youth leader, went into family ministry. Last February, Matt asked me to come and preach at his church. And I went and preached at his church. Unknown to me, he got up the following Sunday. He said, we're going to do this. And as the senior pastor from the pulpit said, over the next 90 days, I'm going to tell you every Sunday how many family times our families have done during the week. And he measured 
and reported back to the congregation. Now, Matt had a small church, probably about 40 or 50 families. At the end of three months, those 40 to 50 families had done over 260 family time lessons in their home. We can make changes a little bit at a time. Now, I'm going to show you some personal slides here. Back in 1976, I was a young chap out of college, decided to go learn how to mountain climb. My first mountain was Mount Hood. So this not in 1976 on Mount Hood. Let's see the next slide. That's the summit. If anybody isn't here as a climber, you will get a kick out of seeing that there's a gold line rope. We didn't even have synthetic ropes back then. I mean, uh, nylon ropes. Jeans and a wool shirt. Now we went on to climb Mount Rainier. This is our camp halfway up Mount Rainier and then on the summit of Mount Rainier. Those early climbs in 76, I started climbing mountains around the world. So the next one, this is over in the Himalayas. Um, it's a 25,000 foot peak. This is Mount McKinley in Alaska. Aconcagua in Argentina, 23,000 feet. Uh, that's the summit of Peak Communisma at 25,000 feet in the Himalayas. Mount Cook in New Zealand. Let's stop here for a second. Now, why am I telling you this other than I like to see these slides on a big screen? I want you to think of mountain climbing as an analogy for the spiritual training of our kids. When you mountain climb, you run into all kinds of obstacles. And there are many who climb to reach the summit, okay? Many are climbing to reach the summit. But in mountain climbing, the majority of accidents actually happen on the way down, not on the way up. The majority of accidents happen on the way down. Why? Your adrenaline is shut down. You get your eyes on getting home, and you're not as safe, stuff like that. Okay, let's go back to the slides. So we had to cross rivers. This river was rolling boulder-sized rocks just down on us, and so we roped up and got across this river. Show you a few more of the challenges. There's an avalanche. The front of that avalanche is over 600 feet high. We actually took this picture from 17,000 feet. I went down. I was at a base camp at 14. Another avalanche let loose. It went across a glacier two miles long, uphill a quarter of a mile, and then over our tents. So there were some incredible avalanches. Next. Steep rock. If you fall here, you're going to fall about a mile. Let's keep going. Steep ice. Again, this is on Mount Cook, um, just front pointing all the way up. Uh, crevasse fields and ice falls, this is on Mount Cook. Glaciers, this is actually on the equator. This is in Ecuador, so it's amazing. This is on Mount McKinley in Alaska. Glaciers, we had people fall through the crevasses and had to get them out using ropes and stuff. Heavy exposure just walking along these knife ridges that you do not want to fall off, okay? So why do we do all this? You do it to reach the summit. That's the south summit of uh, Mount McKinley in Alaska, or Denali in Alaska, and we're getting ready to go to the north summit, the higher summit. Let me show you a couple summit pictures here. That's the summit of Mount McKinley or Denali. There we are. Summit of Aconcagua, Summit of Peak Communisma, and then let's stop here. Like I was saying, most of the accidents happen on the way home. If you're a climber and you set your goal at getting to the top, that's not the right goal. The goal is getting home safely. Let's look at one more slide. I think this is uh, about the last slide. Oh, it's a climber who had high altitude sickness and um, was, he eventually died as we were trying to carry him off the mountain. Next slide. There's a climber on top of Aconcagua. He got to the top, was tired, sat down, never got up. And last slide. This is a memorial stone at the base of Communisma for all the climbers who had died on the climb. Here's my point, and here's how I tie it into, spirit, into children's ministry and spiritual training of kids. 
If you set your goal as getting home safely, all kinds of stuff, bad stuff can happen to you. If you set your goal as how many kids do I get into children's ministry, into children's ministry program, we've only gone half the way. Our goal is getting the kids home safely to the home their heavenly father has prepared for them. That is our goal, to get the kids to the home their heavenly father has prepared for them. Believing kids end up in jail for drugs. Believing kids end up in violence. Believing kids have sex before marriage. It isn't just about, we all want for our kids to profess Christ, to know Christ, to follow Christ. But to follow Christ, it's going to take the home doing ongoing discipleship before and after their commitment. Our goal in children's ministry is not just to get them into our programs. Our goal is to get them home safely. Amen. Amen.